You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEgroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody, that music means it is time once again to break down the wild world of futures options. Yes, it is time for TWIFO. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-compelling network upon which so many of you have been mainlining these days. Of course, if you're listening on demand, all we ask is that you keep rating and reviewing. There are so many new people Discovering not just the world of options these days, but the, of course, the world of futures options, you know, commodities, everything are in the headlines just about every day out there. So more and more people are becoming aware and interested in these markets. So if you like what you hear, keep grading and reviewing. It does help all those new discoverers of these markets find a path to our door. Of course, if you want to go above and beyond, join us for our exclusive shows like Options Oddities every Friday and the Pro Q&A sessions Every Tuesday, got a double dose of those coming up for you next week, as well as our giveaways. And of course, join us live for this show, everything else we do throughout the week. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go to learn more. And let's see who's joining us in the CME and FTSE Russell hot seat today. I'm pleased to be joined once again by Mr. Tim McCourt, the managing director and global head of equity products over there at CME, because that usually means he's got some cool new products in his hot little hands. Mr. Tim, welcome back to TWIFO, sir. It's been, oh, about a month. Yeah, great to be here. Uh, Always looking forward to our conversation and, you know, glad to keep the trend uh, continuing of being on here with new products. You know, that's our, that's our, that's our thing here. You know, you got, I got a bit of a bone to pick with you. The last time you were on, I was kind of pressing you about some new crypto stuff and (laughs) you were, you were hemming and hawing. And then like the next day I see the announcement from CME and I'll curse you, Tim. Couldn't tell us on the show. So you're being cagey with me. We'll see if I can get some more out of you as we keep on rolling. It is time for the movers and shakers report. 
It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers Report. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Movers and Shakers, the portion of the show. We break down everything, lighting it up to the light side, a.k.a. the upside, and to the dark side this week at CME, which is a broad swath of products. You guys can find this report for yourselves if you follow CME. Of course, on Twitter, they tweeted out. We also tweeted out at options right before showtime. So you can see this report for yourselves every week. Mr. Tim, you know what I'm going to ask you next. Where should we begin our journey this week? To the light side or to the dark side? Uh, you know, let, let's go with the dark side today. Oh, feeling dark a little side. dark side in you this week. All right. I can get behind that. So <laughs> I usually choose dark side myself. The few times I get a chance to choose. All right, to the dark side we go, listeners. And uh, number five on the dark side this week, our old friend, the Russell 2000, coming in at 6.35% to the dark side. That's that's quite the week out there. If we expanded the top five to a 13, it would have been number 13 to the light side last week, up 1.64%. By the way, obviously, uh, this has been a mostly red week outside of today. It's seeing a lot of green on the screen today. Uh, so the the reds have it when it comes to this report. It is predominantly, roughly a little over two-thirds, looks like, bias to the dark side this week. You can put together about a top 10 if you really want. Um, the green side, that's kind of about it. So a lot of darkness, which means Russell 2000 had to sell off a bit to break into the bottom five, but it did this week. Number four, it's silver right ahead of it, just narrowly edging it out off 6.4%. have seen silver in our movers and shakers in quite some time, so that's kind of interesting. Number three, back to the metals again, it's copper off 6.69%, so a rough week for the metals out here. Number two, one we talked about recently on the show, for the first time in quite some time with Carly Garner last week, it was lean hogs off 6.99%. We talked about them last week because they were number two in the other direction, up 11.29%. So wild couple of weeks out there in the livestock markets. And number one, once again, back to the metals, it's palladium off 10.42%. This one has been rocking and rolling pretty much every week for months now. So I may have to expand my three usual suspects of nat gas, Bitcoin, and lumber, maybe to include palladium soon if it keeps that up. By the way, none of our usual suspects in the bottom five this week. Bitcoin's actually number seven off 5.58%. So can't break the bottom five this week. All right, to the light side we go. Number five, it's the peso, the old peso USD. Don't see a lot of FX on our movers and shakers these days, but peso breaking it in on what is otherwise a pretty quiet week to the upside, except for number one. We'll get there in a second. Uh, peso up 1.97%. Number four, our old friend Rough Rice up 3.27%. Then number three, it's Arbob up five, almost 5.5%, five about 5.45%. Number two, soybean oil. The beans have been moving quite a bit last couple of weeks as well, up 7.78%. But nothing can hold a candle to our number one this week, which is heating oil up 24.3%. Wild week for heating oil now this is one of the rare weeks where like i said listeners we don't see nat gas we don't see lumber and we don't see bitcoin anywhere in our bottom or top five so intriguing stuff out there mr tim i would ask you where you want to start this week but i kind of have a feeling where you want to start because you always come with some cool new products i think this week we're heading to the equities first it's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, everybody, welcome to the equities. You guys know where to go to find these for yourselves. Go to seemegroup.com slash TWIFO, T-W-I-F-O. Then go to that asset class, drop down, scroll down to the equities, and then we will begin our journey there, Mr. Tim, one of the reasons, in addition to your scintillating personality, one of the reasons I enjoy having you on the program is because you always come with some cool new products up your sleeves, sir. What do you have in store for us this week? Yes, yeah, so today, uh, this week is certainly an, an exciting time for, for CME in our equity options offering. This week on Monday, back on the 25th, we launched Tuesday and Thursday options for the E-mini S&P 500. And it was a great day on Monday when we look at how these products were received by the market. Over 79,000 contracts of the Tuesday expiry traded on Monday, 
establishing a little over 76,000 contracts of open interest, which made the launch of the Tuesday e-mini options for S&P 500 the most successful options launch in CME Group's history, which is phenomenal. Uh, you know, we talk about, we've talked on the show before, Mark, that product launches are exciting, but sometimes launching options markets can be a bit of a challenge given just the, the quoting bandwidth, the technology, everything that goes into quoting all those strikes and all the permutations of puts and calls. It just takes more. Uh, but to have this market stand up like it did on day one, have the market uh, embrace it and continue to trade from there, it's been a really great thing to see. And what's interesting is the trend continues. You know, when we look at yesterday's volume, for today's, you know, the Thursday expiring options, almost 95,000 Thursday options traded yesterday and about 18, 19,000 of the Tuesday options traded yesterday. So it's also a very interesting to see as the, as the week kind of advances in time, you're now seeing that, that investment thesis prove out of people are kind of rolling forward throughout the week. Tuesdays were popular, front half of the week. Thursday is hyper popular yesterday or Wednesday. And now, you know, tomorrow we're moving to Fridays and then Mondays. So we're really seeing people take advantage of the short dated expiries and off to a great start here for Tuesday and Thursday options at CMA. You certainly picked an interesting week to launch the other days of the week here, Tim. Got some action. You know, it's not like you launched them in the dog days of August and nothing's happening, sir. You picked a an intriguing week, sir. Were you excited by that? You think that's going to drive some people in? Were you maybe a little bit nervous? As you mentioned, these are new products. Got to make sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed and the equity markets are just melting down before your eyes while you're launching them. Yeah, you know, it's always a good question because it could either be helpful or hurtful, right? Sometimes when there's so much going on in the market, your liquidity providers are focusing on managing existing risk, not necessarily committing to a new product on day one or mass quoting across the entirety of, of the of the ball curve for, for that given maturity. So it was great to see. Certainly, a little bit of market volatility can always get the, the options markets going. Uh, so certainly, it was a great backdrop to launch into where people were reminded of the precision that shorter dated options offer when managing risk. And it gave people a new tool in the toolbox if they wanted to deploy new trading strategies Maybe they wanted to be a bit, a bit more judicious with the, the theta they were going to pay for their, their option exposure. Uh, you know, we're kind of in the, in the midst of earnings season here in the U.S. Uh, so a great time to, to, for people to focus on increasing the precision of those option trading strategies and now using effectively what we have as daily options in the, the S&P 500 complex here at CMA. Yeah, you're right, because a day like that, you might think, well, that's great. It's an explosion of volume, a great time to launch a new product. But also, if everyone's in a fast market, things are widening out, the paper is decidedly one-sided, and maybe not the ideal time to put a new product out there. So yeah, it certainly was an interesting one. And you're right, we're, we're there now. We've been talking about this day for quite a while, Tim, ever since the traditional notion of the monthly expiration Friday went away. And we've obviously been past that for a long time. It's kind of quaint now, that notion of once a month expiration. But we've been joking for a while. You know, it seemed like the S&P was going to get there first with pretty much the daily expirations. And now we're there, Tim. If you're an S&P 500 options trader, you have an expiration Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So you have no more excuses. If you have a day of the week you want to trade, Tim, you guys have a product for them. Finally, we are there. Daily options. No, thank you. Feels great. And it's always good to hear from, from listeners and customers and market participants out there because it was clear that the folks uh, thought this would be a useful tool added to the toolbox. They, they needed it. You know, we did have, and we talked about it on the show historically over the years, when, back when a few years ago when we launched Mondays and Wednesdays, we didn't want to rush. You know, we always thought there could be a use case, but it was really the feedback we got from everyone out there that, in the, especially in these type of markets, uh, the, the shorter time period of being able to exactly pick your day and not overpay for the risk you're managing uh, in terms of either that theta or gamma profile is really something that I think the market is embracing. And when we look back at the last few months, you know, it, was a, it was a record quarter for equities at, at CME Group here where we traded about 7.9 million contracts per day uh, in, in Q1, which, which is astounding. Uh, and then when we look at some of the other, you know, micro e mini records, and this is a, this is quite the volatile market that we're seeing a lot of risk being managed, a lot of a lot of hedging. Uh, the backdrop of what's going on is certainly reminding people that it, that it's important to manage risk, uh, and it presents opportunities for people to get involved and deploy new strategies. 
Uh, so it's really been interesting. And I think certainly the, the culmination of that with people embracing the Tuesdays and Thursdays right out of the gate uh, is, is a story we're going to continue to see, I think, the next, next few weeks and months here, as, as certainly the risk is going to remain in the market. Well, that certainly seems to be the case. You know, whether you buy into today's rally or not, we have a great question about that right now. Listeners, get on over there to add options. We're asking you, does this rally have legs or are you buying in here? Or is this just a dead cat bounce? This only has less than an hour left. This is going to run the length of the show. This is a flash poll. So get in there now. Right now, it's like 72.2% leaning towards the dead cat bounce route. 27.8% saying, yes, this rally has legs. Again, you got a little under an hour to get in there and make your voice heard but tim you know we talked about you know having an expiration every day of the week and that besides just being a good soundbite it opens up some interesting options pun intended you know back in the past when we had monthly expirations you could trade between the months and that was kind of it then we added weeklies and so now you could do weekly calendars but having daily expirations opens up a lot of interesting strategies that really weren't viable before you could trade let's say you want to do a spread before and after the day of a fed announcement you know you could do that now so i know it's early days you only have a few days behind us and it's kind of a bit of an aberrant week but are you starting to see that kind of paper creep in where people are spreading between the days themselves yeah i think you know it's still a little bit early in that regard but certainly we've seen a little bit of that in the the type of strategies that have been deployed on tuesdays and thursdays but I think even just anecdotally, the feedback we've gotten during the validation processes that we that we conduct here at the exchanges, that was exactly one of the use cases where people talk about managing uh, spreads around uh, economic news releases, whether it's the Fed, whether it's earnings, right? We were just talking about earnings season a few minutes ago, uh, whether it's uh, corporate actions, right? That might be how to, you know, like might be market moving corporate, you know, announcements and whatnot. And if people are taking views on, uh, like if we look at some of the news cycle around uh, Netflix earnings, we saw the the news around Twitter, right? You know, as these things are percolating in the market, you could be more precise about, you know, how are you trading the market uh, from one day to the next? And you don't now have to just pick Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. You can kind of do it Tuesday versus Wednesday, Wednesday versus Thursday. You can kind of work it one day at a time. Uh, if you if you think something might be happening or you're looking for protection or hedging, these are all great things to do. Uh, and, and now, you know, I think what, what's interesting is we'll see what what clients and customers and all the listeners out there come up with. I mean, they certainly always cobble together interesting strategies. So uh, in a few weeks' time, we'll be able to say what's the most popular strategy for Tuesday and Thursday. I'm excited to see what that is. And I'm sure, Tim, it was no coincidence that you have these live, oh, a week before the Fed announcement, the next Fed announcement, probably a day when people might want to do a little intra-week trading. Was that part of the plan all along or just a bit of a happy accident? You know, perhaps, you know, you might be on to something. Typically, when we're launching uh, products here at CME, I want to make sure we give them as much chance of success as possible and, you know, introducing options or products before people need them as a tried and tested strategy for success uh, of our product launches here at CME. Uh, so, yeah, we definitely wanted to get it out while earnings season was still happening uh, and certainly before some of the, the macro policy and the Fed stuff might, might, might be creeping into the market uh, later, later, uh, later this month. I often find it's better to give people things before they need them than after. That's uh, yes. <laughs> usually a better a better policy. <laughs> well, speaking of how people need things, we mentioned uh, some need and some action out there in the Russell 2000 this week. In fact, it's in our dark side at number five, off 6.35%. So let's sink our teeth in there first. Right now, listeners, you guys go to that same drop down. Go down to Equity Indices, U.S. Index Mini, then go down to the Russell 2000. You'll see a pretty active week closing in on 30,000 contracts. Right now, we're at about a 1917 in the Russell 2000 coming into showtime. So that's off about 21, almost 22 points, about 1.12% just this week. Of course, you expand that to last week's show. That's where you get that six and a third percent move to the dark side. Back below the 2000 level again, which is a, a psychologically important level. I know a lot of people like to watch out there. It is an equity, so as is usually the case, about 30% of the volume going out tomorrow. <laughs> uh, looks like 19 half calls are all the rage. Those were not small delta a day or two ago, getting pretty small now. Those are pretty active this week. Let's go a little bit farther out so we can sink our teeth into a little bit, a contract with a little bit more meat on the bone here, listeners. Let's go to the week three a May contract that has 22 days to go. If you're wondering, the vol out there back over a 30. By the way, Talking about vol, I didn't even set the table yet from a, a vol perspective. Coming into the start of this segment, uh, we had uh, RBX, which is the VIX of the Russell 2000, at about 33 and three quarters, listeners. That's up five and a quarter points from where it was this time last week. And if you had 
checked that earlier this morning, it would have been even higher. We had vol coming in, obviously, a little bit today. Uh, VIX Cash was at about a 28 and a half. When we kicked off the show, that puts it up about six and three quarters points from where it was this time last week. VVIX, a.k.a. the Vol of Vol, at about 115 and a half. That puts it up six and a quarter points. So Vol staying pretty frothy out there. Vol Q, so the at the money Vol of the NASDAQ, a.k.a. the, I used to say one of the newest. Now it's now one of the many tradable products over there from a Vol perspective at CME. 31 and a quarter. That's up about five points from this time last week. So NASDAQ Vol, obviously, Pretty frothy. That puts that VIX to RBX, so that large cap to small cap vol spread at about five and a quarter points, listeners. That's about one and a half points tighter. So that has come in uh, quite a bit. And the VIX to vol Q, so that NASDAQ to S&P 500 vol spread, two and three quarters points. Uh, that's surprisingly tight. That's three over three and a half, about 3.65 points tighter than it was this time last week. So both of those spreads coming in quite a bit. Over the course of this past week, back out to the Russell 2000 listeners. And you said the RBX is at about a 33, almost 34. But we're seeing similar levels in the week three May contract. That vol almost a 31, about 30 and three quarters, up about a quarter of a point right now. Uh, Skew wise, last week, the puts were 14 and a half percent bid. This week, it's 13.2 percent. So the puts coming in a little bit, I guess, you know, that makes sense as we've gone down the skew curve a little bit, expect some of those some of those strikes to come in a little bit. The calls last week, 11.9% cheap. This week, even cheaper, 13.8% cheap. So once again, you guys always ask about the small Delta calls in the Russell 2000. If you're interested in them, 2170s in week three may were also trading quite a bit this week. Uh, they're getting cheaper this week than they were last week. So that may be intriguing for you. It's all, it looks like it's all out of the money calls. 2100 calls trading quite a bit in the regular monthly May contract as well. So that's kind of where we're, we see a lot of action looking have to look pretty far to find some puts it's like 17 half puts week two may going out in about 15 days did a little bit of action this week as well listen but yeah it's mostly calls 19 halves 2170s 2100s we're kind of leading the dance across the board mr tim before we roll on out of equities anything else you want to leave with our audience sir, on the equities front no you know i think uh just just what you were reminding me about when you're talking about the Russell 2000 there, a uh, few things for folks to keep in mind is, you know, when we look at the Russell 2000, those options are futures continuing uh, to grow in, u- in utilization here at CME. They're up about 35% versus last year doing almost 9,000 contracts per day. Uh, and I just remind people to keep, you know, about two, we're about two months out from the Russell recon. That's going to be here before we know it. It's always a big event. Uh, for the Russell trading community. So just want to remind everyone to start doing their homework on, on the Russell recon. Uh, and then same thing with NASDAQ. You know, this is something we've been talking about, though, that index choice matters is the theme here uh, at CME the, la- the last few years. And certainly that that reigns true with, with volatility, Mark, as you were just talking about. And NASDAQ options on futures are, are also uh, up about 40% versus last year. And we did just introduce the Mondays and Wednesdays in both the NASDAQ and Russell. So again, just reminding people that you use those short dated options as best you can. They're a great risk management tool. Uh, and as we head into, uh, you know, into May here, which is hard to believe it's almost already May, uh, we think that this index choice matters theme is going to, going to continue, going to persist. And, you know, don't just stick to the S and P, uh, get out there and get involved in all the indices uh, and keep everything uh, in mind for that, the big Russell recon. So we'll be here before we know it. Yeah, it's hard to believe we're already talking about recon again. It's, just, it's crazy, yeah. but that's where we are in the year. And you know where else we are in the show, listeners? It's that time to break out a segment. We don't get to talk about a lot, but we, I like when Tim joins us because we do. It is time to talk about some crypto. It's time to explore the volatile world of Bitcoin, Ether, and more. It's time to talk about crypto. All right, everybody, welcome to the crypto segment. You guys can find these for yourselves. They have their own section in the TWIFO dropdown listeners. Go right out back to that asset class and go into cryptocurrencies. You'll see the indexes, the main ones, so the big products. And then you also find the micros in there, which, Mr. Tim, the last time you joined us, a little over a month ago, March 24th, was right to coincide with the launch of said micro Bitcoin and micro ETH options. We've got about a month under our belts now. What are your thoughts on the early days of trading here on these new micro options? Sir? Yes, you know, I think it's actually just about a month to the day. Uh, they launched back on March 28th. 
Uh, just as a reminder to everyone out there, the micro size Bitcoin and Ether options are one tenth of their respective tokens. These are options on the micro size Bitcoin and Ether futures. These are a great tool for those sophisticated active individual traders out there looking for ways to, to hedge exposures or maybe some of the cryptocurrency that they have in their, in their portfolio or just looking to deploy uh, individual crypto trading strategies on our options. Uh, and it's been a great first four, four or so weeks. We've traded over 40,000 contracts. Uh, OI has been averaging about 28 to 30,000 uh, in the micro crypto options. We're seeing both Bitcoin and Ether trade, which is great. Uh, the one thing that, that to note is interesting, uh, micro ether options doing a little bit better, uh, than Bitcoin. But I think that, that kind of harks back to, I think, Mark, a theme that you and I have talked about before that, uh, the crowd out there, I think, likes to trade ether a little bit more than Bitcoin. Uh, so with some of the volatility going on, ether seems to maybe be doing uh, a little bit more volume than, than Bitcoin. I think we're seeing that in the option, option space where micro ether is doing over 5,000, uh, contracts per day. Uh, just about. So it's been great. You know, we're, we're really doing uh, all we can to make sure we're listening with customers, listening to the market. Uh, Microsized crypto options are another example out there. Uh, but, you know, we got, we got ways to go. We got, we got more we're doing to try and grow these products and encourage people to check them out, but also a great start. You know, you answered one of my questions. I was kind of wondering if ETH, the micro ETH was going to resonate a little bit more with people out there, just from our own audience and and listening to the people on our crypto rundown show, it does seem like there is a strong contingent out there. You know, Bitcoin makes all the headlines, but in, in the crypto space, there are a lot of folks who are knee deep in the ETH world. So I was kind of wondering if ETH was going to take the volume crown. And it sounds like, Tim, that is the case. The folks are are trading it up over there on micro ETH even more than the Bitcoin right now, sir. Yeah, so certainly we've seen early days that that tends to be the trend. But, you know, I wouldn't count Bitcoin out just yet. You know, people, people love uh, to trade Bitcoin, I think. Even though Bitcoin, you know, I would say plus or minus, probably a little bit range bound these days, which is probably maybe taking some of the fun out there uh, for some folks who are looking to looking to trade it. Uh, but yeah, I think you know what we've seen historically is that some action uh, or price action in Bitcoin, we're starting to see people hedging with options, hedging with micro futures. Uh, but yeah, so I don't know if either's got it forever, but uh, you know, early days they've taken the pole position against their their micro crypto option siblings for Bitcoin. You heard it here first from Tim McCourt. CME has officially declared micro ETH the winner. Don't bother with the Bitcoin. It's all about the ETH. These days. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of other of other products and other altcoin, Tim, I was giving you a hard time on the last show. I was like, come on, give us something. Give us something. And no sooner did we pretty much turn off the machines last time, Tim, and then the news breaks that you guys over there at CME adding 11 new cryptocurrency reference rates and real-time indices. In fact, looks like they went out this week, April 25th. So you were holding out on me, Mr. Tim. You could have given us at least one, sir, just to tease us with one. It's like, <laughs> it's just you and me chatting. There's nobody else, right? It's just two guys talking. And you, you left me high and dry, sir. That's right. You know, I, you know, I have to apologize, but, you know, corp- corporate communications does a good job of keep, keeping the reins on. And could nah, they're not listening. It's just me and you show. talking. <laughs> just two guys chatting. Yeah, and no, it's great. I mean, we're very excited. We've launched 11 new cryptocurrency benchmarks here at CV with our partner, uh, CF Benchmarks. And it's 11 reference rates, which are the once a day fixing, as well as the real time indices, um, that, that tick, uh, second by second. So it's something that when we look at this is we're excited about. You know, we launched the New York reference rate version of Bitcoin and Ether back in February. And this week, we started publishing 11 new rates. And, and just to kind of give people some color out there, you know, the, the 11 rates that we publish, they're, they're non-tradable products. They're, they're reference rates. They're regulated under the, the EU BMR regime. Uh, crypto facilities is the administrator CF benchmarks. But they really are speaking to the 11 that we picked. So now that we've added them to the Bitcoin and Ether family of reference rates, uh, this really now gives us about 90% of the market cap of those cryptocurrencies that are that are really tradable. So, you know, taking out the stable coins, the kind of meme coins and tokens that exist out there, this really represents 90% of those tokens that are tradable that have an underlying protocol uh, with some sort of utility. And when we look at adding the likes of Algorand, Cardano, Chainlink, Cosmos, Polkadot, Polygon, Solana, Right, even Uniswap as well as Stellar uh, and Bitcoin Cash and Litecoin, 
we're focusing on those that are either first generation uh, coins like Litecoin and Bitcoin Cash, or they're or those proving the scalability or efficiency of the existing Bitcoin or Ether networks or protocols that are out there. Uh, this is where we're seeing a lot of demand from the marketplace, even for that once a day fixing rate, that once a day reference rate, because as the market is trading more of these in the spot market, they're enter- they're entering into uh, whether they're commercial transactions or whether they're doing projects on the, the associated networks or protocols, everyone kind of needs a once a day reference rate to point to. And that was exactly what we were hearing back in 2015 when we introduced the Bitcoin reference rate or 2018 when we introduced uh, the Ether reference rate. Uh, so it's really great to, to work with our partners in the marketplace to get these 11 new rates out there. People can go and certainly check them out at, at cmegroup.com. We have all the, the information on a little widget there that people can, can check out. And it's something that we just encourage people to do. If you want to go right to the page, uh, it should be cmegroup.com slash crypto benchmarks uh, and just, just check out the information. Yeah, I'm looking here. You guys went pretty deep. You didn't just pull, you know, your standard top 10 market cap coins and that was it. You guys went went pretty deep. So I'll just give it to you for the full list here, listeners. So Algorand, Algo, that's again, that's not a top 10 coin there. Cosmos, so Adam. Uh, Solana, obviously that one's top 10 these days. We see that along, around quite a bit. Bitcoin Cash, another interesting one. We don't always see that in the top 10 out there, but an active one nonetheless. Litecoin, another frequent offender out there. Uh, Stellar, Cardano. Another one I know a lot of you like and sink your teeth into and talk about on our Crypto Rundown pr- program. A polka dot, it's in and out of the top 10 a lot these days. I think it's out of it right now. Uh, XLM, another one we don't see that often in the top 10 out there. Chainlink, again, that one, we see it popping up every now and then. Again, kind of uh, it flirts with the top 10 every now and then. Polygon and uh, Uniswap. So a pretty deep bench of reference rates, listeners. So if you're intrigued, uh, again, I was... Teasing Tim, giving him a hard time on the last show that when we're going to see some more altcoin, here you go. These are, again, not tradable. These are just the reference rates, but we all know that's the beginning of the process. If you want to have a tradable product, you got to start with a reference rate. So, yeah, these are these are some some pretty interesting choices, Tim. I'm going to sink my teeth into these quite a bit. And I'm I'm looking forward to I don't think it'll be your next appearance, but I'm looking forward to some time in the future, Tim, when you join me here on the show. You're going to come armed with some hot new futures on at least some of these, sir. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. You know, we're certainly going to be listening to customers. Uh, you know, right now we're focused on getting the reference rates up and running and establishing that that data set. Uh, we're also working in the marketplace where you know folks outside uh, the U.S. in particular have have always looked at these for structured products, ET, ETFs, ETNs. Uh, so we're we're happy to have these reference rates out there, uh, and and there's certainly a lot of utility for them right now. We'll be working with everyone to figure out. Uh, where should we be looking for additional product development? Uh, and then the one other thing I'll say on the reference rates, I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity. Uh, you know, we're adding our sixth constituent exchange to our cryptocurrency reference rate family. We're starting uh, next week on May 3rd, LMAX, LMAX Digital uh, will join the likes of Bitstamp, Coinbase, Gemini, Ipit, and Kraken as one of our constituent exchanges. Uh, now, not all six exchanges are supporting all of the reference rates. So also go to, to our website and you can kind of see a nice little graphic of which exchanges are support contributing transactions to which reference rates. But it's also excited to have our six consistent exchange join us next week. And you mentioned that reference rate methodology. We haven't talked about that in a little while. Those are obviously your way to kind of take a broad cross section of a variety of different venues. Maybe really quick for some of our new listeners, Tim, break down why you guys decide to go with this approach of the reference rate versus what they're typically used to. They look for corn, they just go to the corn market at CME or copper, whatever it may be. But for the crypto, you take more of a, a reference approach. Yeah, that's a great question. So just as a reminder, the once a day CME CF reference rate for cryptocurrency are published at 4 p.m. London time. And the calculation window runs for an hour, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. London time. And that one hour is partitioned into 12 equally weighted five-minute windows. In each five-minute window, we take the, the, the token or coin versus fiat dollar. So it's those spot transactions only against fiat dollar, not against a stable coin or USDC. It's against cold hard uh, US dollar cash. And we then take the volume weighted median for that five-minute window and then we straight line average those 12 five minute samples to come up with the, the reference rate. And what that does is that it gives us a broader representation of where 
the the underlying spot market is establishing a price, uh, and we have certain obligations in terms of it being a regulated benchmark and us having regulated futures on Bitcoin and Ether, that the underlying reference rate must be resistant to manipulation. That methodology of taking a sample across the 12 five-minute windows using median versus mean, this is really just designed to give robustness and efficacy to that reference rate. Uh, my background, even before being at CME, I was an equity index trader, so I always have a little bit of a sweet spot for indexing uh, and reference rates. But it really also then gives the market the opportunity uh, for a convergence. You know, our futures products based on Bitcoin and Ether, uh, it settles against the reference rate, which is based on spot market transactions. And it helps keep that interrelatedness between the futures market and the spot market uh, in check in a way for market participants to potentially move between the various underlying spot liquidity pools and the futures market. And then the six exchanges that we that we that we now have in our in our CME CF reference rate family, they have to meet strict inclusion criteria with respect to the per, the uh, percentage of that spot market they are representative of. They have to meet certain requirements with respect to KYC and AML. Uh, there's kind of a litany of technical standards they must meet. So there's also kind of some really uh, r- rigor around the, being included in this reference rate that really give a high degree of trust and transparency to what the once a day value of that underlying token or coin is. And same thing with the real time index, similar methodology, uh, but calculated on a second by second basis. Uh, so a tremendous amount of thought. And rigor has gone into these reference rates, and the market uh, has really embraced it for Bitcoin and Ether. Uh, and we really feel these are some of the preeminent cryptocurrency regulated benchmarks out there. And really looking forward to see how people use the next eleven that we launched this week. I'm looking forward to it as well. Now, Timmy, get a little bit of a break. You get to rest your voice, have a beverage. While looking at the dark side here, we saw a lot of movement to the dark side in the metal. So we're going to hang out there next. It's time to explore the options activity in silver, gold, and other shiny things. It's time to talk metals. All right, everybody, welcome to the metals. Like we said at the top of the show, a lot of dark side movement in the metals this week. Number one to the dark side was palladium, off nearly 10.5%. You know, if you've been listening to the show for a while, not a lot of options action in palladium. Then we've got three and four with copper off 6.69%. And silver off 6.4%. And it does show how much evolution we've seen in the copper options market. When we first started doing this show, or even the previous iteration of it, the long and short of futures options, copper options were kind of an afterthought. A few thousand contracts here or there. That was about it. They're closing in on 20,000, which means it's pretty much neck and neck with silver right now, which is kind of interesting. Silver is still still leading the dance out there, but only by a couple of thousand contracts, which again shows you how much evolution we've seen in the copper market. But we know a lot of you like to hang your hats in silver. I know Uncle Mike has been on the show many times, a big silver aficionado as well. So we're going to hang our hat out there this week. Go to that drop down, listeners. Get out of the equities, get out of the cryptocurrency, go down all the way to the bottom to metals, then go to the precious metals, then slide one down to silver. That's where we're hanging our hat this week. A 23 and about a quarter is where silver was coming into the start of this segment off 4.4% 4.4% just this week, obviously 6.4% if you go all the way back to last week's show. In terms of action, like I said, about 21,000 contracts on the tape, so a decently active metal, but not it's no euro dollars, obviously. And in terms of where the action was, it was June with about 46% of that paper. June has about 27 days to go. If you're wondering, what is the vol out there these days in silver? It's at about a 27. That's up one and a half points. So that's that's nothing to sneeze at. It's hanging out right around where VIX is, a little bit shy of where the small caps and Russell 2000 are. So that's a, a decently volatile metal out there. In terms of skew, we had a pretty decent evolution in the skew this week as well. Last week, the puts were unched. They had no bid at, or discount to the at the money at all. This week, there are three and a half point discount. So the puts have come in quite a bit. The calls last week, 3.1% bid. This week, Leaping up to 6.6%. So quite the evolution. Puts getting crushed. Calls getting bid up. Again, we're moving down. So that is kind of what you would expect out there when, from that skew curve to rotate around the at the money. But still, that's, that's an aggressive move, particularly on the calls. In terms of the action, I said we're at about a 23 and a quarter. And it's the 25 calls that were leading the dance. Actually, I take it back. No. Just barely shouldering them aside. The D40s, 40s. 
<laughs> got about 1,400 of those going up this week. So silver looking a little bit reminiscent of gold right now and that they like their funky out-of-the-money call action. These 40s have been trading all week. 700 on Monday, 400 Tuesday, yesterday, traded a couple hundred, trading again today. So a total of about 1,400 all week long, half of them on Monday. All of that was opening all week long as well. Looks like about 700 of the 50s have traded again all week long, a little bit every day, but not enough to be. Well, today looks like it might be a vertical because it's the same number of 40s and 50s had trades. So like some 40, 50 verticals have gone up as well. But yeah, weird upside paper also happening in silver now, not just in gold. Looks like some 40s outright as well as some 40, 50 verticals. Again, it's about one by two. Looks like the, the volume of the 40s versus the 50s. So that's interesting. They'll go back to the 25s in June. That also pretty active this week with about 1,200 contracts. The big day yesterday, so almost 1,000 of them. So almost the whole week's action going up yesterday. All of that opening. A couple hundred today. The rest, the pittance scattered throughout the rest of the week. So a lot of opening action on the 25s this week as well. And given the fact that we're seeing that call skew leap up quite a bit there, in June, you got to wonder if some folks weren't opening buyers on those 25 calls. Again, we're at about 23 and a quarter. What are your thoughts? June 25 calls. Do you think silver can get there by June expiration? Looks like somebody does, listeners, and they're willing to put some money where their mouth is out there. I'll tell you what, since I mentioned it, let's also take a quick dip over there into copper. We're going we're gonna to swing over to the base metals now, listeners. So drop out of the precious, go down a couple of slots to the base metals then we're going to click on copper it has a little over 19,000 contracts on the tape right now listeners so not the quietest week but a pretty decent week out here in terms of copper options of course if I can get my system to play ball we're hanging out a little bit slow out here today but of course 19,000 contracts on the tape for copper listeners as we keep looking here we go all right thank you (laughs) <laughs> Better late than never. 19,100 to be precise. Contracts on the tape in copper this week, listeners. And if you're wondering, copper right now at about a 444, so a 4.44 out there, off about 15 cents or about 3.4% just this week. Obviously, if you go back to last week, it's off nearly 7%, 6.7% or so. And of that paper, again, almost 20,000 contracts on the tape this week, about half of it, 53% coming in that June contract, has about 27 days to go. So copper, not just volume-wise looking similar to silver, but vol-wise, that June vol is at about 26 and a half. Remember we said the June vol in silver is at about a 27. So very similar there. It's up about three quarters of a point this week. So decent volatility to be found in both of these metals and similar volume levels. That is interesting. Not so much on the skew side this week, though. The puts were 1.7% bid last week, about 1.1% bid this week. So not a lot of action there. The calls, 1.3% bid last week. Catching a little bit of a lift this week, up to 3.3% bid this week. And in terms of action, I said we're at the 4.44 level. It's the 430 puts, 4.3 puts leading the dance this week with 1,300 contracts on the tape. Seems like most of that actually today, 700 of that 1,300 going up today, almost 500 on Monday, opening throughout the week. Obviously, we don't know about today's paper, but it does seem like some folks getting a little bit interested here in some of these 430s, maybe writing some uh, slightly out of the money puts in June here. That is interesting. And follow right behind it. Actually, you know what? I missed another longer term one here. <laughs> so going out to uh, going out to September, the five half calls were actually winning the race this week with 2,200 contracts, 1,000 today, 1,000 yesterday, and the rest kind of scattered throughout the week. Most of that opening yesterday. So opening paper on the five halves. Interesting. Looks like 545s also traded a couple of hundred times this week, yesterday, and a couple hundred times today. So could be one by four, 225 by a thousand, 445, five half. That's a very tight spread if that was the case. Uh, That is weird if related paper out there, but the five halves trading 2,200 times. Uh, So forget what I was talking about earlier with the 430 puts listeners. The five halves are pretty active in September. And if that's not rich enough for your blood, the July sixes also trading. A thousand times all of that today. So it looks like the fives, five halves, and sixes all traded pretty actively today as well in July. A thousand of the sixes, 630 of the fives, 562 of the five halves, and just for fun, 250 of the 480s as well. So 
<laughs> bit of a funky uh, ladder or strip there. Either way, upside. We talked about upside and silver. It seems like some folks are pretty active in the upside as well here when it comes to upside and metal. Speaking of active, you folks are always active with your questions. Let's get to some of those right now. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for Futures Options Feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, Mr. Tim, I hope you enjoyed your break because we got a product request for you now coming from a listener. This was Wolfgang Amadeus. So apparently Mozart writing in with a product request for you, Tim. He says, hi, please add futures options to the Micro Russell 2000 or tell me the date when it will arrive. Also, if you can make Micro Nikkei 225 and Micro S&P mid cap 400 futures, please. Yes, volume is lower, but micros will allow more access, increasing volume overall. Please add it, exclamation point. So there you go, Tim. He's very polite, but he wants some new products. What do you say? He wants, uh, he wants micro options on the Russell 2000, as well as micro Nikkei and S&P mid-cap 400, sir. Yeah, I think all great suggestions. All great suggestions. You know, we've actually, we were just talking about um, when we look at micro options. Right now, we are still kind of focusing on the S and P and Nasdaq. Uh, we're still working on on building those markets. Uh, go, going pretty well, right? You know, we're seeing good markets across uh, across the trading system. You know, all all day and all night. Uh, we launched those um, a little while ago, and you know, we're doing okay. The micros are doing about forty thousand in the E mini. Uh, sorry, the micro E mini S and P about eight thousand in the micro Nasdaq. Uh, so we're going to start to look to expand out, but you know it's, it's a balancing act where we want to make sure the ones we have out there uh, take root, uh, and we kind of get those in a good place before we start looking at possibly the Russell or the Dow. Uh, but he's not alone. Certainly heard a lot of requests for for micro Russell and and micro Dow, especially when we're talking to or looking at some of the overseas market. Uh, we know the Dow is always a popular trade, uh, particularly out of the out of the Asia region. Uh, and yeah, when we look at other micro sized contracts, all great suggestions. Uh, we've certainly had a tremendous amount of success uh, with micro products at CME. When we look at, we now have just under two dozen micro sized products that have traded over 1.4 billion contracts uh, since they were all first introduced. And then when we look at the ADV for micros in Q1, 3.7 million contracts, micro contracts trading at CME. Uh, so it's great. You know, we've got lots of things on the horizon. Certainly something we're going to be continuing to work with the marketplace to make sense. Uh, and certainly uh, stay tuned for what other indices we might add to the micro family here at CMA. Tim, you got to be excited. Amadeus coming back from the grave. And he doesn't want to make a new symphony. He just wants micro options from CME, sir. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's keep with the, the equity theme right now, listeners. We have this question of the week right now. It's got about a day or so left in it, listeners. Uh, we're asking you right now, when we posted this at the beginning of the week, we said, you know, we're back in the red in most of the major equity indices. So how are you positioning in your broad market S&P 500 type portfolio right now? I'll give you four choices. So you're still long your S&P, could be SPY, could be SPX, could be whatever, me, mini, whatever flavor you want. You're still long that. Or you're long that, but with a put or some other type of hedge in place. Or you're in cash, maybe waiting to buy a dip or two out there. Or you're saying the heck with it. And you're moving to crypto. Mr. Tim, if you had to guess, which of these do you think our audience is choosing right now, sir? I don't know, Mark. I mean, it's a tough one. Um, I will say, I'll give you a hint. There's no clear leader. It's all very neck and neck. Crypto? Oh, wow. Like crypto always wins you, you are the that. crypto man. I will say that's the one surprise I have in this. I, I, I Maybe I misled you because crypto is the one thing that's not getting any love. <laughs> <laughs> crypto only 3.3%. It's very tight amongst oh, everything else, though. Enough. No love for crypto. Yeah. I was stunned by that. Yeah. Wow. 
There you go. So, uh, yeah, right now. Keep keep the surprises coming. (laughs) Right now, in cash, waiting to buy a dip is just slightly winning with 35%, followed by exactly a third, 33.3% of you saying, uh, you're still long your S&P 500 positions. Could be in any flavor, E-mini, SPY, SPX, whatever you're trading out there. 28.3% of you saying, you're long the S, but with a put or some other hedge in place in case the, the war should come to pass. And again, bringing up the rear, only 3.3% Tim saying they're in or moving to crypto. Maybe <laughs> maybe some of those reference rates will will gin that number up a little bit. We got to get more crypto, folks. That That's that's a terrible showing, sir. We got to work on that. <laughs> I, I firmly blame you for that, sir. So right now, yeah, you got about a day or so left. If you're going to crypto, maybe you're going to some of those. We we're just talking about your Solanas and everything else. And you're saying the heck with this S&P? Hit us up. Let us know. By the way, we have that flash poll going right now. It's going to end pretty much the end of the show. So podcast listeners, on-demand folks, you're pretty much out of luck unless you're voting right now. Go to add options to make your voice heard. That's a good reason why you should be hanging out on our Twitter throughout the day, listeners, uh, because we have a flash poll right now. Does this rally we're seeing today in the indices, does it have legs? Are you buying this or is it just a dead cat bounce? That one's pretty easy. 75% of you saying this is the dead cat bounce. Only 25% saying this rally has legs. You got pretty much till the end of the show to make your voice heard there. Let's go out to this. We got time for one more here. Let's go to PJ Max. PJ Max says, hello. Well, hello, PJ. Because I wanted to say I'm very much enjoying the program. Uh, I'm a crypto fan and disappointed there's not enough Bitcoin options activity at CME to discuss every week on the program. Well, that's true. We try. You know, sometimes on the big options in particular, there's not a lot you left. We're still waiting for the micros to start percolating through all the quick strike system. Then we'll have a little bit more data to sink our teeth into there. Uh, he goes on to say, but I'd like to know the host thoughts on the ProShares Bitto ETF. This seems like a good introductory step for many of the listeners who may want to trade the CME Bitcoin futures, but only have equity accounts. It also has a fairly robust options market for options traders. Do you agree? Yeah, this is an interesting product. We have talked about it quite a bit. It is If you're looking to trade crypto in a securities account, it's one of your, your few games in town right now. You got this and pretty much the grayscale. You got there's others that have come out since Bitto, but Bitto has kind of sucked up all the oxygen in the room. It really does all the volume. And on the options front, it's there's no options on the grayscale. So Bitto is really the only game in town. And it's doing decent options volume, about 60,000 contracts a day. I know, Tim, when you joined us back towards the end of last year, when the Bitto product first launched, there was all this consternation that Bitto was going to blow out the CME futures and hit position limits, and also that the roll yield was really going to wipe out this product. It seems like we're close to six months in now. It seems like a lot of those concerns have mitigated, and people are kind of just trading it up. Is that your takeaway as well, sir? Yeah, you know, a few months in uh, since that debuted in October and continues to, be, to do well in the market uh, using CME Bitcoin futures uh, to underlie that ETF. And you know, I think, you know, always good questions from people about position limits and the the financing spread around the roles. But, you know, it's kind of worked as designed, right? You know, uh, a, a few months in and no issues on the position limit side. Uh, it's something that the exchange watches and we work with market participants to make sure they have everything they need to, to operate their product and hedge their risk. Uh, you know, we'll have to, you know, the I think the, the role cost and the financing is obviously something we're always paying attention to. Uh, market loves lo- lo- loves to chat about it, uh, but I think it's always important to remind people out there is that the the futures prices is, is a futures price. You know, you're not necessarily indifferent between trading the future and trading spot. So when you're looking out the curve and and you see some of that roll cost or that the 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 richness or cheapness priced in uh, to to the future, it's of the carry cost, the yield you should be extracting from the underlying digital asset as well as insurance costs, trading costs. You know, it's, it's an all-in price for where it should be in the future. Uh, and I think it's just important to people to remind it's not the same spot. Uh, and I think, but that works okay because, you know, ProShares have been able to, to package it up and put it into the, the BITO ETF. And it's been I think, the most successful ETF launch ever in the U.S. with respect to, I think, hitting the billion-dollar market mark in two days uh, when it came out in October. So that, it's doing great and we're happy to work with those guys to continue to make sure they have everything they need uh, as they look to to serve the market through their retail offering. It's been great, great success story. Yeah, it has been kind of surprising. We actually just talked about this, uh, PJ, on our Advisors Options show earlier this week. So I'm going to pull some of the data we crunched from that for you. But when it first launched in October of last year, everyone 
and their mother were wringing their hands, not just about their position limits, but also about their roll yield. There were estimates of 13 to 20 percent a year. This thing was going to have headwinds in terms of negative roll yield. For all the reasons we've discussed many times, all these products that use the futures that have to roll down the curve. If you have a traditional contango, that could come back to bite you. What we've seen is a couple of surprising things, though. First off, the contango in the Bitcoin futures is nowhere near as steep as you would see in a lot of other products out there, whether it's a crude oil or a volatility, whatever the case may be. For a lot of reasons we talked about you know, earlier this week, you know, there's that basis trade between uh, the spot and the futures. You could buy the spot on any venue, sell the futures, and it kind of crushes down a lot of that contango. So the slope isn't as steep, which is usually would come back to bite you as you're buying a, let's say, a two-month out future and then selling it when it expires in that front month as you're rolling down that futures curve. The slope is not as steep, and that has translated into pretty decent tracking. We ran the numbers again earlier this week, and you know, depending on your frame of reference from launch to the end of March or from launch to the end of last week, you know, Biddle did a pretty good job tracking Bitcoin. It was only off about one to one and a half, maybe 2%, depending on your frame of reference, which again, you're talking almost six months. We were talking 13 to maybe 20% people were expecting. So that's done a much better job of tracking Bitcoin than I think a lot of people expected. And the negative roll yield has been nowhere near as pronounced as people thought. And we had the ProShares folks on a couple of weeks after the ETF launched, and they came out and said they didn't think those initial numbers people were talking, they thought it was going to be a lot less than that. And that has turned out to be the case. So if you're intrigued by this, PJ and everyone else, and for whatever reason, maybe you don't want to dip your toes into the futures yet, but you want a way to trade those and trade options on them, certainly, uh, you could do worse than trading Bitto. It, it is a far better product in terms of tracking and impact of roll yield than a lot of people assumed when it first launched last year. So a great question, PJ. We'll keep watching this and it should be an interesting one to talk about in the future. All right. That music means you have survived another episode, Mr. Tim. But before you go, I will give you one last chance. If there's any hints, any teases you want to leave our audience with in terms of cool new products from CME coming down the pikes. I don't see a release. Maybe let's say tomorrow, about 15 cool new things that you're launching. If you want to get ahead of that now, sir, now is the time. The floor is yours. Oh uh, yeah. No, you know, I don't want to ruin, ruin the fun, Mark. So I got, I got nothing else to break here today, uh, but look forward to coming back and always enjoy being on the show and just remind all the listeners out there that if you want to check out anything else we've talked about today or covered, just go to cmegroup.com. It's always a great resource, resource for all things at the exchange. Uh, and just really encourage everyone to get out there, uh, do your homework, and, and keep those great questions coming. L- love the questions from the crowd today, and, and really looking forward to see how some of these things grow that we, that we covered today's show, Mark. Yes, head on over to See Me Group. While you're there, seemegroup.com slash TWIFO is the place you can go to get all the reports we talked about today and just about every other product under the sun over there at CME. So if there's something we didn't talk about today you want to analyze for yourself, seemegroup.com slash TWIFO. Those are active all week long, so... You don't have to worry about going at 2 a.m. as all the reports aren't on. They're always there, ready and waiting for you. And, of course, you know where to go to learn more about all things small cap. Tim mentioned Russell Recon, not that far away, right around the corner, listeners. And that's a pretty impactful event. You want to learn more about that, the impact of COVID. They have the whole COVID impact center, the impact on small caps, all the other stuff going on over there, volatility, everything else. FTSERussell.com, FTSERussell.com is the place to go. Give him a follow on the old Twitter as well, at FTSERussell, all one word. We have to get on out of here for today. Listen, that's going to conclude our broadcast day. Don't worry, we're back again tomorrow, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern for volatility views. And for all you secret club kids, coming back 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern for options. Oddity is going to break down. The exciting week that was in terms of unusual options activity. So we'll see you there. And then, of course, back again next week, another episode of This Week in Futures Options. Stay safe out there, everybody. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options.
This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME group. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. 